Aww. Even the baby is yeah, yeah, <laughs> Why not? Break a tradition. Yeah, that's right, break a tradition. tradition. Alright, everybody. How many is glad to be here? Amen. I mean, I wish they were somewhere else. Please don't raise your hands. <laughs> said if you, if, you, if you're if you think you're stupid raise your hand and this little boy stood up and raised his hand she said why why you raise your hand she said because i don't want you to be the only one raising your hand did it by itself she would say all right just leave this here yeah on. we can just pass it around oh just pass it yes all right let's go ahead does anybody have a special prayer request you have to share with the congregation uh, all right anybody anybody else Let's just go to the Lord of prayer. Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you for this chance to be in your house, to worship in spirit and truth. I ask you right now, Lord, to bless all these people, Lord. There's a lot of this going on. There's a lot of trouble. There's a lot of tragedy. We trust you, God, to take care of it. Lord, you're more than able to take care of every problem. We trust you with it right now, knowing, God, that it's in your hands. Those that have had deaths, Lord, bring comfort. Those that have sickness, bring healing. Those, Lord, that have destructive uh, mechanisms in their house, Lord, destroy that. In the name of Jesus, we love you. We thank you for it all. We thank you for this service tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray in church. Amen. 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 Next time, Tim, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's, it's good, good to be in the house of the Lord. Lord. Hey, everybody, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, so now, uh, the last few, we talked about problems. And everybody's got problems. I got problems. You got problems. All God's people got problems. <coughs> and so, just to end it, I was going to just do a little, a smaller one, but it's kind of grown a little bit. So it's still going to be a two-parter, but it's still good. And and I want you to pay careful attention to it because this is going to, going to, going to. I believe is going to help you see things differently. And when you see things differently, do you know that you see what you're prepared to see? Everybody. You're prepared, you see what you're prepared to see. It's like if you go up in a house, like when the church got hit by a tornado, and I went up inside, I couldn't tell all that was uh, all that was bad because I was looking for one thing, but a professional carpenter went and saw another thing because he was prepared to see the other stuff. Okay, so the same way is uh, uh, you see what you're prepared to see. If you don't want to see anything, or you want to be blind to something, you're going to be blind to it. If you want to be open to it, you're going to be open to it. So the same way in adversity, we want to be open to God's move and to see adversity in a whole different light because actually diversity is our friend, it is not our enemy. Amen? I know it's hard to think that sometimes, but diversity is our friend because it helps us to grow and it helps us to grow in ways that nothing else can help us grow. Okay? So, uh, if I had a scripture, I was I was wondering what kind of scripture to use for this. So if I had a scripture, I should have put it up here at the top, and I will next week. But Second Corinthians four eight through ten. Second Corinthians four eight through ten. I've got all kinds of Bibles open up here. I got one on my phone. I got one in my <laughs> on, on the table here. But uh, we, God, God has something for all of us. Amen? And and we just got to trust Him in the middle of all this. So here we go. Everybody got an outline? Does anybody need a pen? We got pens up there. Anybody need a pen? Anybody need some coffee? A donut? Not a donut, but a honey bun or, or a blueberry <laughs> snack muffin? Okay. So here we go. Using Jesus as the example... And you can use it by, by watching his life. I'm just going to, uh, again, I weren't sure exactly what scriptures to be using because there's so many. And so I was trying to keep it keep it down to a manageable amount. So 2 Corinthians 4 is actually talking about all Christians. And so, so it's, it's cool that you can see this. Ready? You, you, uh, how many know you want to be able to handle adversity in your life in a way that pleases God? It's coming. You cannot stop it. Adversity is coming. Look at somebody and say, you can't stop it. You can't it's stop it. It's going to happen. So, if it's going to happen, then I want to learn how to use it in a way that brings glory to God.
to God. Okay? Whatever I do, I want to bring glory to God. So if I'm going to handle adversity, I want to handle it in a way that pleases God and also get the most bang for the buck, so to speak. So then we're going to look at how Jesus handled it. We're going to imitate him. And then if you imitate him, then you're going to succeed. So the first thing, and you can look in John 17 and see this. You can look all over the place, but, but Jesus, is, Jesus knew his purpose. He said, I came from God. I came from the Father. I came to do his bidding. He knew his purpose. And because he knew his purpose, it gave him focus. The problem with a lot of people these days in their marriages, in their life, in their job, in the church, in their Christian life, is they don't know their purpose. And because they don't know their purpose, then they just kind of beat around and kind of hit around, and they're kind of like riding the back of a truck. You know, uh, I know it's different now, but back when I was in the rescue squad, if you were doing CPR in the back of the rescue squad, you were kind of in trouble because there was no way, there was nothing to hold on to. I did CPR for almost 30 minutes in the back of the rescue squad, and I'm standing up, and, I, and as we're going down these bumpy roads, there's nothing for me to hold on to. So I'm trying to do CPR and trying to hold myself at the same time. And, and uh, I think about that. Uh, some of us now, we're riding down the road, we're being bumped all around, we don't have a purpose. And so we just kind of bounce around. I've done that before, and every now and then I bounce around now when, when I get my eyes off my purpose. So it gave him focus because he knew his purpose. Satan's desire is to break our focus. How can he break our focus? He breaks our focus. You can write this down, and you can even think of some more if you want to. He breaks our focus through adversity. All of a sudden we're watching adversity. And as we're seeing adversity, we no longer are watching what God is doing. We're watching what Satan's doing to us. Uh, uh, others, we can watch others because they may not be called for the same purpose that you're called for. And so while you're so busy watching others, you lose your focus on what you're supposed to be doing because you're watching everybody else. I learned a long time ago that, that, that it's like a baseball team. The, the, the first baseman is not supposed to do what the third baseman does. And the third baseman doesn't do what the left fielder does. The left fielder doesn't do what the right fielder does. Everybody's got a purpose. I was coaching basketball. And when I was coaching basketball, I, I had the guy that was a center. It was, a league, it was league ball. And so I, the guy's daddy was helping me coach. And the guy wouldn't stay. I, I said, I need you to stay. I need you to stay in the paint, and I need you to stay uh, uh, under the basket, right? Because you're so big, you can rebound for us. And when he stayed under that basket, he was so awesome. But every now and then, because somebody blown his head up about how he could play ball, <coughs> he'd get crazy and start going all over the place and playing. Right? And so. Uh, one night he was sitting there and he was shooting and making them too, but he was he'd get over on this side of the court, this side of the court, over here, over here, but the but nobody was getting rebounds like they're supposed to because he wasn't there. And I looked over at his dad and his dad said, I know, go ahead, you're not gonna hurt my feelings. And I and I called him up, I said, Brandon, come here. He said, Look at me, coach, I haven't missed a shot yet. I said, Yeah, you're not gonna miss that bench either. <laughs> I said, sit down. Right. He said, But coach, I was making all these shots. And I said, but you weren't where I needed you. Right. And I said, you missed our second chance opportunities. You missed all this stuff. You didn't see a lot of baskets are made because of a second opportunity because you get a rebound. And I said, you weren't there. So I need you to sit there until you learn your purpose. And he sat there for about 10 or 15 minutes. He sat me on the shoulder and said, Past, not Pastor, he said, Coach, I think I learned my purpose. <laughs> and after that 10, 15 minutes stay on that bench, he never had that problem again. He learned his purpose. Some of us are sitting on the bench now spiritually and wonder why we're sitting on the bench. It's because we don't know our purpose and we're trying to do everything else. And God said, no, I don't need you to do everything else. I need you to do what I've got you to do. It. So, adversity, uh, others, and get ready. This is, <laughs> this is not going to be pleasant, but it's true. Adversity will break our focus. Satan breaks our focus through adversity. He breaks our focus by looking at others. And he breaks our focus by helping us become spiritually lazy. Anybody ever become spiritually lazy? You want somebody else to do your praying? You want somebody else to do your fasting? You want somebody else to do your studying for you? You know, uh, uh, open your Bible on Sunday morning only, and maybe not even bring your Bible to church. You just use the Bible in the pew, and, and so you don't read your Bible, you don't pray, you don't, you don't get involved, and so because of that, that's how Satan breaks our focus. So, our purpose is not to fail, but to bring life, to dispel darkness. A thief is only, a thief is only there to steal, kill, and to destroy. 
I have come that they may have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. John 10 and 10, that's the message. God has a purpose for everything that comes <laughs> us. And that purpose does not include failing. Doesn't mean we're gonna we don't, we don't mean we're gonna bump our I bump my toe all the time. <coughs> Just because I fail every now and then doesn't mean I'm a failure. Okay? When Thomas Edison was defending the light bulb, he he took him ten thousand tries so he finally came to the right kind of filament. And somebody said you just had 10,000 mistakes. He said, no, I found out 9,999 things that wouldn't work. Mm. Wow. That's right. Wow. So he wasn't a failure. God didn't call him to fail. God didn't call us to fail. We're going to have times that we don't necessarily meet the mark, but it's because of a lack of training, or maybe we are going the wrong way, or God sometimes <laughs> wants us to fail. When a basketball team gets really, really cocky, you know, I'm a Duke fan. I know y'all y'all all are too. <laughs> There's only two of us in here, I think. Yeah, two of us. Woo! Two of us. All right. Uh, but you know what? When they get when they get too cocky <coughs> and they lose a the game, and Linda will say, "I know that's got you upset." And no, that's the best thing that could have happened to them. And she said, "Yeah, I know. Go ahead, give me the philosophy." I said, "Because they got they got overconfident, and they began to trust in their own I mean, trust in their own ability versus the game they're going to be playing." And, and they just blew it. I said, they need to get back to the basics. And when they get back to the basics, is to stumble. So said, okay. So now, I'm going to tell you how you can find your God-given purpose. Get ready to write this down. If, if you want to know your God-given purpose, or, how, or I won't say necessarily the exact purpose, but what the purpose is going to revolve around, okay? I'm going to give you the, 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 uh, the, the static version of your purpose. Write down purpose... And in parentheses beside purpose, put vision. Vision. God gives every one of us a vision. Something that he's trying to put burns in our heart that we need to be doing. Vision. You can take that vision. There's a vision for our family. There's a vision for our church. There's a vision for us individually. We all have vision. Okay. So we have multiple visions. It's not, it's not all the same. We have multiple, multiple visions. So, so again, here's what we're going to do. I need everybody just to think about it. So just, just for a moment, just for a moment, I want you to stop, and I want you to think, and I want you to think, uh, what am I passionate about? Vision. What am I passionate about? What is it in my life that really I can't get off my mind? Uh, I, it's just there all the time, and I'm always trying to find a way to make things better in this opportunity. Uh, as opportunity arises, I, I seek it different ways to get involved in this. That's when you start finding your purpose. Okay? Some people say you got to you know, think you can get on your knees and pray four hours a day to find your purpose. No. God gave us we got, He gave us some natural stuff that actually transforms into spiritual stuff. So so what is it that stays on your mind? What is it that, that, that you dream about? What is it that you want to be part of? That is part of your purpose and your vision. The other part of the vision is, how can I make it better? So that's why I have a vision, a vision for your family, a vision for your marriage, a vision for your work, a vision for church, a vision for your own spiritual life. Well, what can I do to make it better? Now, what somebody else can do, what can I do? All right? So here it is. Here's, how you, here's, something, about, here's something about a God-given purpose or a God-given vision. Number one, it is bigger than you are. Wow. It's bigger than you are. Now, when I lose my focus, you're right beside that, when I lose my focus, I go too small. There's a lot of people who have missed the mark. They say, God, look what I've done. And they've done this little thing here, and God had this thing here ready for you to do. God had all this wonderful stuff he wanted you to do, but instead of that, you lost your focus. You wanted something simpler, something easier, nothing, something that was not bigger than you. It was too small. Yes, you were successful, but honestly, you could have done so much more. So, first thing about a God-given purpose is it's bigger than us. It seems like everything I work in, everything, everything I get going in, always winds up being bigger than me. And right to start with, it used to scare me. It still makes me gulp sometimes. 
But you know what? It's okay. Because God does not want us, you know, God wants us in over our head. So they're, tra they're traveling, they're just, they're just taking their legs and they're going out into the shallow water. And they're doing it on their own strength. When you get in over your head, now you've got nothing to stand on underneath you. You're in over your head. And now you've got to trust God to take care of you. You've got to trust God to give you strength. You've got to trust God to keep you from sinking. So, it's bigger than you. Number two, <coughs> it requires more than your energy and your efforts to complete it. It's powerful. It requires more than what? My power and my, my own power and my own energy to complete it. Whatever he's got me doing. Because if I can go up my own power, and matter of fact, I'm going to say right beside it, you can put a mark beside it. When I lose my focus, now I go on my own strength. I'm going small, and I'm going to my own strength. God wants us to think big. <coughs> He's got so much for us to do, and he wants us to think big, not small. Number three. Number three. In the end, God will get the glory. It's bigger than us. It requires more than us and our own strength to complete it. So in the end, God will get the glory. They'll say, wow, I know that was God. You couldn't have done that. I think I told y'all this last week. I think I did. Uh, one of the guys, one of the guys stopped me in Lowe's parking lot, and he said, "I just want to tell you how much Mighty Army has meant." And he said to me, and he said, "I started sending it to my sister in South Carolina, and she said, can I please get her added to this?'" He said, "It's one of the people I got you to add to the list," and he talked about how much that helped her life and blah blah blah. He's been on and on. I said, "I said, hey, <coughs> it's not me. It's God. I'm just a Western Union guy." And he said, well, I know it's not you. You're not that smart. <laughs> okay, just in case I got the big head, he just popped it. <laughs> okay, if you lose your focus, it just glorifies you. So once you've lost your focus, you go small, you go in your own strength, and it glorifies you. But when, you get, when it's God's given a purpose that's bigger than you, it requires more than you complete it, and in the end, God will get the glory. That's powerful. I'd much rather hear, much rather hear down the road, wow, God did something awesome, or I know God did that. That's much better. I love to hear that. I don't like to hear, you know, I want to hear, look what the Lord has done. Amen. Can't you see what the Lord has done? Mm -hmm. Versus how great I am. How great I am. You see those people hanging to go, you're talking to them for about 30 minutes, and they'll start and they go, look, enough about me talking about me. Now you talk about me for a while. <laughs> All right, here we go. Number one, he knew his purpose. It gave him focus. Number two, now here, we're going here's we're gonna lower it, lower it down a little bit. And and I'm gonna hit hit this hit the scripture that we started out with pretty hard. He knew his path. It's one thing to have a purpose, but another thing to know the path. Because you may know my purpose is to be an airplane pilot. But the path is you got to go to school and you got to get your training, you got to log your hours, blah, blah, blah. So a lot of people know, well, my purpose is to be a pilot, but because I don't want to go that path, I won't do it. Last night, Linda and I were sitting there doing our homework, and Linda said, you know, I'm doing business, but I'd really love to be a psychiatrist. And I said, well, she said, but I don't know if we got that, that, that long a time. And I said, you know, you got to be an a MD first. And she said, really? And I said, yeah, then you go into psychiatry. I said, you can be a psychologist, you can be a therapist, but to be a psychiatrist, you've got to be an MD. And she said, wow. I said, yeah, mentally disturbed. <laughs> <laughs> so you really got to be MD. Okay. <laughs> uh, so... Here we go. So here it is. He knew his path. <coughs> Do you know that our paths are paved with pain? And our paths are paved with misunderstandings? 
even your own family. Jesus, his own family didn't even believe in after the resurrection. Think about the pain he went through. He carried, he carried our pain on that cross. It wasn't him. Mean, he carried, he was, he carried us, our, our sin on that cross, which gave him great pain. So his pain came from us. That's powerful. So it's paved with pain. It's paved with misunderstanding, and it's paved uh, with how do I want to say this? Uh, new beginnings, because. It required him to do things that had never been done before. You know, nobody had ever died on a cross to save somebody. Nobody had ever resurrected from the dead. Nobody had ever ascended up into heaven. All this stuff. And so a lot of times we're doing our stuff. But we get through, we have, our, our path is paved with pain, misunderstanding, uh, and a lot of new beginnings. A lot of new beginnings. I had no idea at 58 years old I'd be going back to college. I had no idea. But, but again, it's, it's been a very awesome, awesome thing. So he knew his path. It gave him assurance in adversity, trouble, crisis, and danger. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this for a minute. He says in John 16, 33, the New Living Translation, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart because I have overcome the world. Now, now, now again, this path was again, I'm going to, I'm to break down adversity. Adversity, trouble, crisis, and danger. Adversity means to push against. Anybody ever played football? You ain't got, no, you ain't be playing for school. Just play football, period. Okay, and you're playing football. The other team, what's the other team do to you? If they, for, well, they try to tackle you, but, but not just tackle you, they try to stop you. What will they do? Especially if you're playing ball that's, that's, that's got a referee, they're going to push you back. <coughs> push you back. They don't want you over that line of scrimmage. And so they're going to hit you and they're going to hurt you, but they're going to push you back and push you back and push you back. And I remember when I was coaching football, I remember those guys doing some, the other team was doing some terrible things. And you try to and you try to tell the referees, they wouldn't necessarily see it, so you had to learn how to even go beyond what they were doing to, to get forward. I mean, they were breaking rules, but they weren't being seen. They knew how to do it sneakily, you know. But again, you just learn how to get past it. So adversity means to be pushed against. It's like a wind or a storm. Trouble means, in the Bible, tightness, crushing, to be pressed. Crisis, again, is all this in conglomerate. conglomerate but I want to talk about the word crisis here. Crisis, the Chinese word for crisis is, a, is two characters. Danger and opportunity. Danger and opportunity. So in, in Chinese, crisis is a dangerous opportunity. When anything comes our way, something good is going to come from it. We trust God. And of course, danger itself means threatening circumstances or jeopardy. So let's go to the scripture, right? But first, let me read this other scripture first. Satan wants us to forget who his real enemy, who our real enemy is. He wants us fighting each other. He was much rather <laughs> me fighting my brothers. He'd like me when we fighting my kids. You know. Or fighting my wife, or my wife fighting me, or or whatever. He wants us to be fighting the wrong people. My job is not to fight a person. My job is to fight the enemy, and the enemy is Satan. So, just find my brother, Ephesians chapter six. Find my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Did you know, if I, even if I had, a, I don't have a problem with any of y'all in here. But even if I had a problem with one of y'all in here, do you know who the real problem I've got with? is Satan. Satan would rather start, listen, let me tell you something. Satan would rather start a church fight than to sell 100 pounds of crack in yeah. elementary school. Mm -hmm. Satan would rather destroy our family than to destroy the bank. Okay? So it's important. We understand. We're not fighting flesh and blood. But again, and this just lines it up. Princi principal principalities and powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this age. Satan's organized against the spiritual hosts of the <coughs> in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand. After you've done everything you can, just stand. You know, 
Uh, there, there's been times where I, where I didn't know exactly what to do. I, I remember as, as a chaplain at Pittmore Hospital, and you're sitting in there, and, and, you're, you, and you're going from room to room, or going from crisis to crisis, and, and, and uh, that night that we had, that night from 8, to night, eight at night to 8 in the morning, my shift, I uh, had seven deaths and ministered to 55 people from 8 at night to 8 in the morning. Wow. Yeah, and, and when I get a call, I'd have to go, and I would pray all the way to that room, God, you got to help me. Some of them were code blues. And so I said, God, you got to help me because I've got to minister to the family until the doctor does his thing. If they die, then the doctor comes out and tells him. What he does is the doctor tells me to watch out and sometimes even tell me they're dead. But you can't tell them. And we're still trying to do our best to get him back. And 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 then sometimes I said, I don't think we're going to get him back or whatever. But I, my job was to keep the family calm and give them hope. Then they would come in and, and drop the bomb and they'd back off and leave with me for another hour or two. And I remember one night I went in there, and and the lady there was there was there was about a good twenty or thirty people from the family were in the room. Some were Hispanic, some were English, some spoke some spoke Spanish only, some spoke English only, and the mother spoke broken English. And the daughter-in-law had to translate for me, and she had a twenty-eight-year-old daughter who was dying in intensive care, and she was going to die at any moment. And so I went in hot. I mean, right hot, just dropped right in. Boom. And so I go in there and say, God, you got to help me because I've got to be a minister of comfort here, and, and, and I don't know how in the world I'm going to do it. Because I don't even know, you know, what's going on. And so I walk in, and she is all two pieces, and I can't quite understand her. And I said, God, the, the human part of me, because I was just volunteer too. You know, the human part of me wasn't just to run. Hey. <laughs> Y'all can have this, the human part, but the God part, the, the spiritual part was saying, God's got this, God's got this. And so I just, I, 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 so she wouldn't slow, she wouldn't calm down. And finally, uh, I told her daughter-in-law to tell her that I had just lost my mother. And I understand her terror right now. And, and so she told her that, and I said, but... I came through it, and she told her that, and I said, and let me tell you how I came through it, and, I, and she told her that, and all of a sudden, it just started calming down, and calming down, and then finally, I got a chance to talk to her about my mama's death, and how I got through it, and she calmed down, and again, all I could do was stand, I'd done everything else, there was nothing else to do, I just stood, sometimes we think standing is you're standing there like this. That night, I was standing holding on to the promise and holding on to that lady. And and I carried her back to see her daughter. And then we come back in. And by the time we come back in, her daughter died. So I stayed with that family from about 10 o'clock that night till 2 o'clock in the morning. And again, speaking broken English back and forth. Not speaking to translators and going back and forth. But it was amazing to watch how God took that situation where everybody was out of control, out of control, way out of control. I mean, I've never seen it like this, ever. <coughs> and, and when I said, I can't do anything else, God, but stand. That's it. I got nothing else I can do. I can't speak Spanish. And I stopped that girl from dying. You know, and after she died, I can't change anything. And so, uh, but I watched God do something so powerful that night. It was amazing to watch God just intertwine and intervene and, in and move in between and, and change everything. It was just amazing. And 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 like I said, when I got there at 8 o'clock, matter of fact, I said I stayed from 10 to 2, and I was actually stayed from 8 to 2 because uh, I was going back and forth during that time too. So it was like <coughs> 2, o'clock, it was 2 o'clock in the morning from 8 to 2. Um, but, but, but I watched a terrible experience be... Uh, shielded by the grace of God. Nothing I did. It was standing. I done all I could. I was just standing on God. And when they left, they thanked me so much, and they said, they, they said that that, uh, that it had meant so much to them for us to have somebody stay there with them that whole time and minister to them. And it was it was a very powerful night that night. Very very powerful. And again, all I did was stand. I didn't know what else to do. 
So let's read this. Let's read this verse here. This is in chapter four, Second Corinthians, chapter four. Verse 8. You can do verse 7. Verse 7 really kind of tells them too. We have this vessel, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Again, remember, it's bigger than us. It requires more than us to complete it. And when it's all over with, God gets the glory. There it is. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God, not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Christ may be manifest, manifested in our body. So, again, I'm just going to read a few versions of this. I'm going to go into the original Greek, too. But this is a very powerful, powerful message. You know, uh, Again, here's troubled again. This word trouble means to be pressed as grapes or pressed down hard and pressed hard to get every bit of juice out of it. Philip's New Testament says, The priceless treasure that we hold, so to speak, in a common earthware vessel, earthen vessel, is to show that the splendid power of it belongs to God, not to us. Here's how he puts it. We are handicapped on all sides, but we're never frustrated. We are puzzled, but never in despair. We are persecuted. But we never have to stand it alone. We are we may be knocked down, but we are never knocked out. Every day we experience something of the death of the Lord Jesus so that we may also know the power of the life of Jesus in these bodies. And and the Amplified Bible, of course, I love that. We are hedged in, oppressed on every side, troubled, oppressed in every way, but not cramped or crushed. We suffer embarrassments and are <coughs> perplexed and unable to find out, find out, but not driven to despair. We are pursued. Persecuted and hard driven, but not deserted or to stand alone. We are struck down in the ground, but never struck out and destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the liability and exposure to the same putting to death that the Lord Jesus suffered, so that the resurrection or life of Jesus may also be shown forth in our bodies. And so this is some, this is some heavy, heavy, heavy stuff. I've got assurance. Number one, I know it's coming. The Bible says that. That many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many. Many. <coughs> what does many mean? It's not M-I-N-I. It's M-A-N-Y. There's a difference. This is a mini honey bun. I can promise you the trials I faced this last week are not many. M-I-N-I. Amen. They're full size. They're full grown. They would gag a full grown maggot with buck teeth. <laughs> Big. Big. <laughs> Big stuff, okay. But I know that God's got this. Let me just kind of, I, I, I wanted to, uh, to use so we're, we're troubled every side, but we're not uh, uh, depre uh, to uh, not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Here it is. We are cast down, but not destroyed. That word cast down is a, remember now, Paul spoke a lot to Romans. And so because he spoke to people that were familiar with the Roman uh, area and their customs. He spoke a lot about Jesus spoke more about agriculture but Paul spoke about agriculture. Paul also spoke about the soldiers and he spoke about the Olympic Games. How many have been watching the Olympics? I was amazed last night. I'm going to take a little side road. I was amazed last night because I was watching the figure skating <coughs> and third and third and fourth place was Americans. When the Americans come up and do an outstanding job, they're first place now. The French come up and make the highest score ever. They're number one. They had the highest score ever recorded in an Olympic game for five minutes. The Canadians made higher than them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Isn't that something? I had to think all that work and all that. And I was I had the absolute record, the all-time high record. It's kind of like, how do you come in second with that high record, higher than anybody's ever made before, and you still come in second? But that word cast down, not destroyed. Think about this. It's talking about, in the Olympics, it's talking about uh, wrestling. It's talking about a body slam. And it says, my body's been slammed. They slam me down, but I'm not destroyed or counted out. One, two, three. And to make things worse, make matters worse, 
in some of those games when a when a wrestler lost, he may have his eyes gouged out. Wow, that's heavy. So again, <coughs> you want to, if you want to handle adversity, number one, know your purpose, and again. Uh, your purpose may change a little bit as time goes by. Remember, we live day by day. Enjoy the journey, not the destination. If all your mind is set on is a destination, you are going to have a miserable life. Because if, if all you got is, here's your, here's your end, that's all I can see, and I don't enjoy the journey, then I'm going to be miserable by the time I get there because I've got destination disease. But if I know where I'm going, but I'm enjoying that journey along the way, I'm having me a ball because that journey usually is actually bigger than the destination. And so, know your purpose. And then know the path. If you think you're going to be, everybody's going to love you, nobody, no, Jesus, Jesus uh, ministered for three years. The first year, he was <coughs> in obscurity. Second year, he's popular. Third year, they hated him. He knows what it's like. He's been there. So, again, <coughs> Know the path. The path is filled with pain, misunderstanding, and a lot of new beginnings and starting over. So, so it's okay. <coughs> it's okay. Any, any questions or comments? Did I tell God's looking good tonight? With the exception of a couple of you, you're really looking good tonight. <laughs> 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 All right. I wanted to break it down because there's two more to this. And once we get to these, then we're going to start. Then we're, then we're going to find out. Then we're going to go into how you find God's purpose for your life, which is going to be cool. We already started it. We started it before Christmas and we stopped it. And so we're going to go back into how you find it. And that's from Bethany's question. Bethany asked me that question years ago, well, not years ago, months ago. Dad, Bethany said, Dad, how do you know what God wants you to do? And so I started working on, on, on God's purpose for you. And so after this next one, we're going to talk about uh, in depth about how to know God's purpose is for your life. No questions? Y'all are, y'all are doing good. Amen. Now let's pray. Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you for this chance, Lord, to be able to come to you at any time. Lord, I know, God, that the road to success is filled with much pain. The road to our purpose is filled with much misunderstanding. The road to your plan for our life has got many times where we have to back up and punt and we have to learn something new. But God, that's okay because we're going to enjoy the journey, not just the destination. Lord, we love you and we praise your name and we thank you for all that you do for us. In the name of Jesus we pray. And the church said? Amen. 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 Shake somebody's hand and come out and love it.